Будь смиренным, будь кротким, не заботься о тленном. Власти данный Богом, сынок, будь навеки верным. Я люблю Россию, я патриот. Живи просто святому подобно. Не ешь скоромное, потребляй скромное. И станешь на ноги скоро. Зампрокуроры, прокурор, коммунистическая партия, дружба с олигархами. Я патриот, сам из Хабаровского края. И дела решать не в какой-то там вашей геропе выбираю, а на родине, в России матушки предпочитаю. Будь смиренным, будь кротким, не заботься о тленном. Власти данный Богом, сынок, будь навеки верным. Я люблю Россию, я патриот. He had a powerful ally, or so he thought, a man named Vladimir Putin. All that abruptly changed on November 13, 2005. Bill Browder stopped in the VIP lounge of Moscow's International Airport. He was returning from London, detained for 15 hours, expelled, then banned from Russia, deemed a national security threat. My lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, uncovered, exposed it. He was then taken into custody, tortured for 358 days, and killed seven years ago at the age of 37. And I've been on a mission to get justice for him ever since. The laws are named after this man, Sergei Magnitsky. He was a Russian tax lawyer who uncovered what was believed to be the biggest tax fraud in Russian history, $230 million worth. Magnitsky was arrested and later died in prison after being tortured, according to Russia's own Presidential Human Rights Commission. But the Russian government says heart failure killed him and there was no violence. When um, you're reading your book, it reads like a political thriller. It's also a cautionary tale, I suppose, of what happens when you cross the Kremlin. In a certain sense, what it, what it shows to me is that we've really gotten under Vladimir Putin's skin, that, that he has got, he's kind of lost it. Um, uh, he's, he's been mad for a long time and they're just now doing crazy stuff. And this is the craziest of all the crazy stuff they've done. If someone were to find you dead, uh, you'd know uh, who to blame. Yes. All right, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the Dalton Moore School of Business, to be enriched by tonight's opening comments from our featured speaker, Mr. Bill Browder, and from our expert panel assembled from across the University of South Carolina. My name is Al Langto, and I'm the Executive Director of the Folk Center for International Business here at the Moore School. Our Folk Center mission is to establish closer ties with top global companies, maximizing the opportunity to jointly determine and develop the skills required to build 21st century business leaders, one of our top global companies on our board is Alston and Bird. It is my additional pleasure to introduce Mr. Chris Mangum, Magnum, Mangum, sorry, I'll get it, alumni from the University of South Carolina and partner at Alston and Bird. It is Chris's 20-year relationship with Mr. Bill Browder and the generosity of Alston and Bird that has made tonight's event possible. I won't repeat the biographical information you have in your program about Chris, everybody has that. But suffice it to know that he's a valuable member of our folks board and his degree of engagement with the Darla Moore School of Business and the University of South Carolina is what we hope from every graduate and everybody in our community. Chris will now introduce Mr. Bill Browder. First, I would like to thank the University of South Carolina and the Business School for hosting uh, Bill Browder here. Uh, I think this is a very important story. And like uh, Al said, I'm a 1981 graduate of the University of South Carolina Business School. I'm also a partner in a law firm in Atlanta, Georgia. I met Bill uh, in 1997, 20 years ago, back when my hair was probably as dark as that picture in your your program, and Bill probably had more hair <laughs> back then as well. Uh, and, and Bill was running the largest investment fund in Russia at the time, and my, I was managing uh, my clients' investments in Russia. And I went to Russia, and it was introduced to Bill because we were an investor in this fund, and we became partnered with Bill on a number of investments in Russia. And Bill and I became fast friends, and Bill became my mentor in investing in Russia. And, and, and I was in awe as I watched Bill and how he 
exposed corruption in public companies in Russia, the oligarchs were stealing assets, and he engaged in his campaign called Naming and Shaming, and he would go in great meticulous detail in doing reports that he would present to investors. And when Vladimir Putin came to power, this became something that was useful to him because he was trying to get the oligarchs under control. And so the naming and shaming campaign worked for Bill until it didn't. And at some point it didn't, and Bill will tell you that story. And then that led to a series of events which culminated in the death of Sergei Magnitsky. And uh, is at that time when, when after the death of Sergei, we're horrified. And Bill and I were, had a conversation, and he asked me, Chris, do you have some ideas about what we can do to bring justice for Sergei? And I put Bill in touch with a partner of mine named Jonathan Weiner in my Washington, D.C. office. And it was Jonathan Weiner who came up with the idea of the Magnitsky Act. And the Magnitsky Act is the reason, part of the big part of the story we're here to talk about tonight. Bill didn't seek this fight with Vladimir Putin but he didn't run away from it. And it would have been easy for Bill just to stay quiet, live a quiet life in London and enjoy the wealth that he had earned, but Bill wouldn't do that. I mean, Bill is a man of high integrity and high moral character, and he was gonna avenge Sergei's death and bring these people to justice. And Putin has picked the wrong foe. And the more successful Bill has become in seeking justice for Sergei, the more they've engaged in a, in a smear campaign against him. You'll hear a lot of, if you Google Bill Browder, Magnitsky Act, you'll, you'll see a, a lot of mistruths about Bill. And I decide, that's why I wanted to bring Bill here tonight and to let Bill tell his story. It is a compelling story. It's a magnificent and it's a frightening tale. And it's one that I know personally and it's one that I know also to be true. And so I invite Bill to come up here and I'd like you please make welcome Mr. Bill Browder, my dear friend. Good evening and um, uh, welcome to my talk. I'm delighted to be here in Columbia and um, to be here at the University of South Carolina. Um, I want to tell you my story um, briefly. I think we're going to have a discussion. We're going to get into some of the details, but I wanted to um, tell you how I ended up in this crazy situation um, of effectively becoming Vladimir Putin's number one enemy. Now, it may seem odd to um, hear uh, this guy speaking with an American accent, describing himself as Putin's number one enemy. Um, but when I, when I think, <clears throat> when I'm finished talking uh, to you, I think you'll all agree that that's probably the right description. Now, the, um, uh, my, my story is, is, starts uh, about 100 years ago. Um, my, my grandfather, uh, Earl Browder, was a labor union organizer from Wichita, Kansas. And um, he was so good at organizing the labor union that uh, the, the communists spotted him. And they said, if you like labor unionism, you're going to love communism. Why don't you come to Moscow to check it out? And so my grandfather went to Moscow in, in 1927, and he did what most young, red-blooded American men do when they get to Moscow. He found a Russian girl. Uh, who became my grandmother. And um, my father was then born shortly afterwards. And then five years later, in 1932, um, my grandfather was sent back to America to become head of the American Communist Party. He ran for president against Franklin Roosevelt in 1936 and 1940 on the communist ticket. Um, he was imprisoned by Roosevelt in 41, pardoned in 42, he was then expelled from the Communist Party in 1945 for being too much of a capitalist. Um, but that didn't save him from the persecution in the, in, during the McCarthy era in the 1950s where he was persecuted as being a communist. So this is my family legacy. 
I was born in 1964, and I was, um, as I was going through my teenage rebellion in the 1970s, I was trying to figure out what's the best way of rebelling from this family of communists. And I tried several things. I, I first um, grew my hair long, which grew into an afro. You probably can't tell that right now. Um, but strangely, that didn't upset my parents. Um, I followed the Grateful Dead around for several months. Um, also, that didn't upset my parents. And then I came up with this perfect idea to upset my parents, which was to put on a suit and tie and become a capitalist. And there was nothing that would upset my parents more than that. So I became a capitalist, and I ended up going to business school. I went to business school in California at Stanford. And um, I enrolled in business school in 1987, and my business school experience ended in 1989. And that was a very auspicious year, 1989, because that was the year uh, that the Berlin Wall came down. And <clears throat> I was trying to figure out what to do after business school, and all of the normal opportunities for MBAs at Stanford didn't appeal to me. I couldn't get excited about all the normal things, all the things that my classmates were doing. And then one day I had this epiphany that if my grandfather was the biggest communist in America and the Berlin Wall has just come down, I'm going to try to become the biggest capitalist in Eastern Europe. And that's what I set out to do. And so uh, I couldn't quite get to Eastern Europe, but I ended up getting to London at the time. And I was trying to get involved in, in whatever I could in Eastern Europe. And my real break came when I was working at Solomon Brothers. Solomon Brothers is, doesn't exist anymore. Some of you will remember it as this famous investment bank immortalized in liar's poker. And I joined the East European investment banking team of Solomon Brothers in 1992. And my very first assignment was to advise the uh, fishing fleet um, located in Murmansk, Russia, a few hundred miles north of the Arctic Circle, on their privatization. So I flew to Murmansk. <clears throat> I get off the airplane, and the head of the fishing fleet has met me at the airport. And he drives me down to the docks so I can see one of their boats. And before me on the dock was a 300-foot vessel on many different stories. On the top story, they had all the nets which caught the fish, and then they took the fish and put them into some funnel that went down to the next story where they separated them out, and down all the way to the, to the bowels of the ship where they had a bunch of canning machines. And effectively, this was an, what I would describe as an ocean-going factory. And it was very impressive, and I asked the head of the fishing fleet, how much does one of these things cost? And he said, $20 million. And I said, how many do you have in your fleet? He said, 100. So I did the math. 20 million times 100 gets you to 2 billion. Now, I didn't know anything about fishing or even ships at that time, but I asked him, how, <clears throat> what's the average age of your fleet? And he said, seven years. And so I figured maybe that's half depreciated. So a billion dollars worth of ships. Now, the management of this fishing fleet had hired me to advise them on whether the management should exercise their legitimate right under the Russian privatization program to buy 51% of the company. And so I asked him, at what price is the government selling 51% of the company? And he said, two and a half million dollars. Let me repeat the math. <laughs> There's a billion dollars worth of ships, and they can buy 51% for two and a half million dollars. <clears throat> now, you don't have to be a Stanford MBA to know that that's a good deal. So um, at this point, I, sa I, I said to myself, I wonder if this is something which is unique to, the, to this company or to the fishing industry or whether this is more widespread. So instead of going back to London, where I was scheduled to go back the next day, I got a flight to Moscow instead. And I get off the plane in Moscow, and I should point out that I don't speak a word of Russian, and I don't know a single person in Russia other than the head of the fishing fleet. And I get off the plane in Moscow, and I'm at Sheremetyevo Airport. That's the main Mo Moscow airport. And as I'm going through the airport, I notice that there's a little kiosk selling a very thin English language yellow page directory. And so I buy the English language yellow page directory. I go to the Metropole Hotel on Red Square. The next morning, I start cold calling people to set up meetings with anyone who will tell me about the privatization program in Russia. And after, over the course of the next week, I had about 40 meetings. And by the end of this week, I discovered that the privatization program in Russia in 1992 was and always will be the single most compelling investment opportunity that's ever existed in the history of financial markets. And what I discovered 
was what they call the voucher privatization program. In Russia, um, in order to go from communism to capitalism, they decided to create a company full of capitalists by transferring all state property to people for free. And one of the biggest transfers was this voucher privatization program. And what they did was they gave a physical certificate called a voucher to every person in Russia. And at the time, the population was 150 million people. The vouchers were freely tradable bearer certificates that developed a secondary market, and they traded on average at $20 each. So again, I did the math, $20, $20 times 150 million people gets you to $3 billion worth of vouchers. And these $3 billion worth of vouchers were exchangeable for 30% of the share capital of all Russian companies, which meant that the market value of Russia at the time was $10 billion. And just to put this into some perspective for you, this is a country with 35% of the world's natural gas, 10% of the world's oil, 10% of the world's aluminum, 10% of the world's steel. There was fertilizer, there's car companies, there's electricity companies, telephone companies, timber companies. All together, in the entirety, the value was $10 billion. You couldn't get a mid-sized U.S. oil company for $10 billion, but the whole country of Russia was $10 billion. And so on the back of that realization, I ended up ultimately leaving Solomon Brothers and setting up an investment fund called the Hermitage Fund to invest in Russia. I moved full-time to Moscow in 1996. I started the Hermitage Fund, and it was the most spectacular, successful launch of an investment fund in the history of investment funds. I started with $25 million from one very large investor, and over the next 18 months, <clears throat> we went up 850%. I went from $25 million of assets under management to more than a billion dollars of assets under management. Um, I, was the, I was the best performing fund manager in, 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 2000, in 1997. Um, I was um, featured on the front page of the Financial Times, in the New York Times, in Business Week, et cetera, as being some type of financial genius. My clients were sending their private jets to, to take me to their yachts in the south of France to celebrate what a, what, a, what a great guy I was. And I was all of 32 years old. Now, any of these great accomplishments that I've just described to you would have been wonderful in their own right. But if you take them all, put them together, and then put them in the hands of a 32-year-old, that is the biggest sell signal there ever was. But of course, I was 32 years old, and I didn't see that. And so instead of selling, I thought my billion was going to turn into 10 billion, and it was all going to be the most amazing thing. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. In um, 1998, um, there was an economic crisis in Russia. The um, Russian government defaulted on its bonds. They devalued their currency by 75%. And my billion dollars worth of assets went down $900 million. I lost 90% of my clients' money. As you can imagine, there were no longer any invitations to their yachts. Uh, but moreover, I was deeply mortified and ashamed that I had attracted all these people to come and invest with me, and I'd lost all their money. And so I was determined to try to make their money back. The problem was that the people who owned the companies that I was investing in, the Russian oligarchs, had a different idea. The Russian oligarchs had, up until 1998, kind of behaved themselves because bankers from Wall Street had come to them and said, hey, if you behave yourself, we can get you some free money on Wall Street. And the oligarchs, who were not particularly nice people, thought, well, you know what, we can do the stealing later. Let's get some of that free money on Wall Street first. And so they kind of behaved themselves up until 1998. But after this devaluation and default, it didn't matter whether you were a good oligarch or bad oligarch, you were not getting any money from Wall Street. And when that window closed for these people, they said, there's no longer any incentive to behave ourselves. And in Russia, there's never been any disincentive to misbehaving. And so it was an entirely logical thing for an amoral oligarch to steal as much money as he could. And so as a result, the oligarchs embarked on an orgy of stealing, which has been unprecedented in the history of business. They were doing transfer pricing, embezzlement, um, <clears throat> asset stripping, dilutions, all to a fine art on industrial scale. And they were going to try to steal the last 10 cents on the dollar that I had invested in Russia. 
And so as a matter of necessity, I had to become an anti-corruption activist in Russia. <clears throat> now, the most famous anti-corruption campaign I ran was in a company that most of you have probably heard of by now called Gazprom. <clears throat> Gazprom is the largest company in Russia. Um, Gazprom has 35% of the world's natural gas reserves. And in 1999, Gazprom was trading at a 99.7% discount to Exxon and BP per barrel of hydrocarbon reserves. Why was it so cheap? It was so cheap because everybody thought every last cubic meter of gas had been stolen out of Gazprom. And so I decided to do something which had never been done before, which I describe as a stealing analysis of Gazprom. We wanted to figure out how much they really were stealing and how. And so how do you do a stealing analysis of a Russian company? Um, you can't just go to the management and say, excuse me, sir, can you tell me how much you're stealing? Because that wouldn't get you very far. You also couldn't go to the investment banks that were, were, were doing the analysis of Gazprom and other companies because they were so keen to get fee-paying businesses business from, from Gazprom. The last thing they would do is um, badmouth a prospective client. And so I decided to do it uh, in a creative way, which was I made a list of the 40 people I thought knew about stealing a Gazprom, ex-employees, competitors, customers, suppliers, and asked them to a meal, to breakfast, lunch, dinner, tea, coffee, dessert, and see what they would say. So I started to send around these invitations to these meals, and I wouldn't tell people what I, wanted, what I wanted to talk about. I just asked them to a meal, and about 35 of the 40 people agreed to meet. And in my first meeting, I discovered the most interesting cultural anomaly about Russia at the time. And that was that during the Soviet era, the richest person in Russia was six times richer than the poorest person. They perhaps had a, 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 a dacha, a bigger apartment, maybe a car and a driver, but that was about it. By 1999, the richest person in Russia had become 250,000 times richer than the poorest person in Russia. And that all happened over a 10-year period, and it poisoned the psychology of the entire nation. Everybody was furious. They were furious that, that a small group of people got all the money and everyone else was living in poverty. And so when I had that first lunch, the guy I was having lunch with leaned forward and he started telling me these stories of unbelievable graft and corruption. And I had a notebook and I started taking notes and writing more notes and flipping the page and more notes. This went on for two hours and this guy would have gone on for the whole afternoon if I, if I didn't stop him. And the next meeting was exactly the same and the next meeting after that was similar. In the end, I filled up two full notebooks of, of shocking, unbelievable, amazing revelations of stealing. The only problem is I had no idea if any of it was true. And, and so I, I was sitting on what I thought was a potentially a gold mine, but it could have been exaggeration, misinformation, God knows what. And so there was really nothing I could do with it. And, and, I, and I knew I was onto something huge, but I just didn't know what to do with it. And then about three weeks later, we had this unbelievable lucky break. My head of research, a guy named Vadim Kleiner, was driving his car through Moscow, and he came to this, this intersection called Pushkin Square. And Pushkin Square is a permanent traffic jam. Sometimes you can get through it in 15 minutes, sometimes it takes an hour, but it's always a traffic jam. And at Pushkin Square, as a result of this traffic jam, this outdoor market of street urchins has developed where they sell things to motorists. They sell pornographic DVDs, they sell underwear, they sell newspapers, they sell all just crazy stuff. And Vadim was at the, at the intersection in the traffic jam and a kid knocks on the window. He rolls down the window and he says, what do you have for sale? And the kid says, databases. And Vadim said, what do you mean databases? He said, databases. And he opens up his, his soiled down parka and he's got this, these, folder, these uh, clear translucent folders with disks in them. And Vadim said, what's that one? And he said, that's the Moscow Registration Chamber database. Um, this is something we've been looking for. Um, this, this shows the, it shows the beneficial ownership of all Moscow-based companies. And he said, how much? He said, five bucks. <laughs> so Vadim buys the database. He comes back to the office. He's waving the database in the air. He said, some kid claims he just sold me the Moscow Registration Chamber database for five bucks. And I said, I'm sure you got ripped off. So we go to his computer, and this is before the day of computer viruses, and so we put it into the, put it into the, into the uh, computer, 
And sure enough, it's all bells and whistles, Moscow Registration Chamber database, like right in front of our face for five bucks. And we'd really been looking for this information. And then we popped the disk out, we noticed that there was a telephone number on the front of the disk where you can buy the other databases. And so we got the Customs Committee database, the Federal Securities Commission database, and various other databases. And it turned out that Vadim did get ripped off because you could buy those ones for $1. And once we had all the databases, we then compared it with all the notes, and we came up with the most unbelievable economic discovery, economic statistic I've ever discovered about anything anywhere in the world, which was that between 1996 and 1999, the management of Gazprom, nine individuals, had stolen oil and gas reserves the size of Kuwait out of Gazprom. Now, if you remember, there was a war fought over oil and gas reserves the size of Kuwait in Kuwait. And we just discovered it, and nobody knew it. So that was the first most important economic statistic I've ever learned in my life. The second most important economic statistic that I've ever learned in my life is that oil and gas reserves the size of Kuwait only represented 9.65% of Gazprom's total reserves. What that meant was more than 90% of the oil and gas was still there. Now remember, this is a company that's trading at a 99.7% discount because everybody thought everything had been stolen. And we've just discovered that everything is still there, more or less. Now, when you see that type of disparity between perception and reality as an investor, what do you do? Well, to use a highly technical financial term, we backed up the truck <laughs> and bought as much gas from as we, pops we could possibly get into our fund. It became my single largest investment. And at that point, that's when you usually stop as an investor. You make your investment, you find your stuff, you wait for the world to figure it out. But we decided we weren't going to wait for the world to figure it out. We were going to share it with the world. And so I took our dossier to the Financial Times, New York Times, Washington Post, Business Week, et cetera, and each of them wrote a story about it. And on the back of their stories, then the Russian press then wrote stories about it. On the back of the Russian stories, the um, uh, Russian Duma, the state, the parliament, then began debates about whether it was a good thing or bad thing for assets to be stolen out of Gazprom. More stories. On the back of that, the management of Gazprom then hired the American uh, accounting firm PricewaterhouseCoopers to write a report to say it was a good thing to steal the assets. More stories. In the end, there were more than 500 stories written about the theft of Gazprom off of our dossier. Um, and then the most interesting thing happened. At the annual general meeting of Gazprom in the following year, Vladimir Putin, who's the newly appointed president of Russia, or newly elected president of Russia, I should say, um, steps in, he fires the CEO of Gazprom, and as a result, the share price goes up 138%. It then doubled again, doubled again after that, doubled again, doubled again, and doubled again, and then doubled again, and then doubled again. In total, the share price of Gazprom went up 100 times. Not 100%, 100 times. And this was no small investment. This was my largest single investment in Russia. As a result, um, <clears throat> uh, through this, um, combined with various other things, and, oh, and I should say that, that this then gave me this great confidence to do this elsewhere. And we did it at the electricity company, did it at the National Savings Bank, did it at some oil companies, et cetera. All of these things together took my assets from 100 million to 4.5 billion. I became the largest portfolio investor in Russia, and I thought I had the perfect job. Well, I did have the perfect job um, until November 13th, um, 2005, when I, after having lived there for 10 years, <clears throat> I was flying back uh, from a trip to London, and I was stopped at the airport. Uh, four heavily armed guards grabbed me, took me down to the detention center of the airport, locked me up, and then the next day, I was expelled from Russia and declared a threat to national security. After that, things went downhill further. So first thing I did after I was um, expelled from Russia was I said, if, if the Russians are going to turn on me, they're probably going to turn on me more than just expelling me. We need to get our people out. We need to get our assets out. And so I evacuated my staff, and we quickly and quietly sold every last security we had in Russia. And at that point, I thought that I had succeeded in getting out of Russia and that I was done with Russia. It turns out that they were just getting started with me. 18 months after I was expelled, 
25 police officers raided my office in Moscow. 25 more officers raided the office of an American law firm that I used called Firestone Duncan. And they were specifically looking for the stamp seals and certificates for investment holding companies. At the law firm, they found those documents and they took them away. The next thing we knew, we no longer owned our investment holding companies. And I should point out, these companies are empty now because we sold everything previously. They, they've basically stolen, using the documents seized by the police, our empty investment holding companies. At this point, I was alarmed, not for economic reasons, but, but for effectively for legal reasons, because what, if the police are doing this, what else could they be doing? And so I hired the smartest lawyer I knew in Russia, a young man, 35 years old, named Sergei Magnitsky, to investigate. And Sergei was this incredibly smart, hardworking young man, and he went around, he investigated, and he came back, and he said there were two things they were trying to do to you. First was to steal your assets, but they didn't succeed. But the second thing they were trying to do, which they did succeed at, was that when we were selling all of our securities, we had a huge profit. We had a billion dollars profit, and we paid $230 million of taxes to the Russian government. And what Sergei had discovered was that the people who stole our companies went back to the tax office and they said there was a mistake made in the previous year's tax filing. That $230 million should not have been paid. We want a refund, a $230 million tax refund. They applied for the $230 million tax refund on, on, the, on the 23rd of December, 2007, and it was approved and paid out the next day, the largest tax refund in the history of Russia. We were sure that this was a rogue operation, and so we decided to file criminal complaints with every different branch of the Russian law enforcement. Sergei testified against the officials involved, and we thought the good guys would get the bad guys. It turns out that in Putin's Russia, there are no good guys. Um, about five weeks after Sergei testified, some of the same people he testified against came to his home <clears throat> on the 24th of November, 2008, arrested him, put him in pretrial detention, and then began to torture him to get him to withdraw his testimony. They put him in cells with 14 inmates and eight beds, left lights on 24 hours a day. They put him in cells with no heat, no window panes in December in Moscow, so he nearly froze to death. They put him in cells with no heat, I mean, I'm sorry, with no toilet, just a hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up. They'd move him from cell to cell in the middle of the night. And the purpose of all this was to get him to withdraw his testimony against these corrupt officers and assign a false confession to say that he stole the $230 million and did so on my instruction. And Sergei refused to do that. And so they just increased and increased and increased the pressure on him. After six months or so, his health started to fail. He ended up losing 40 pounds, developed terrible pains in his stomach, and was diagnosed as having pancreatitis and gallstones and needing an operation which was scheduled for the 1st of August, 2009. Uh, about a week before the operation, they came to him again and said, please sign this false confession. Again, he refused, and in retaliation, they abruptly moved him from a prison that had medical facilities to a maximum security prison called Butyrka, which had no medical facilities. And at Butyrka, Sergei's health completely broke down. He went into constant, agonizing, ear-piercing pain, and they refused him all medical treatment. He and his lawyers wrote 20 different desperate requests to every different branch of the Russian criminal justice system for medical attention. Every different branch either ignored or denied in writing his request for medical attention. And on the night of November 16, 2009, Sergei's body could no longer tolerate it. He went into critical condition. When on that night, the Butyrka authorities did not want to have responsibility for him anymore. And so they abruptly, <clears throat> or they put him in an ambulance and sent him to a different prison facility that had a medical wing. But when he arrived at that medical wing, instead of putting him in the emergency room, they put him in an isolation cell, and eight riot guards with rubber batons beat him to death. He was 37 years old. He left a wife and two children. I got the news at 7.45 a.m. the next morning, and it was the most tragic, the most heartbreaking, and the most life-changing news I could have ever gotten. Sergei Magnitsky was murdered because he was my lawyer. If he hadn't been my lawyer, he'd still be alive today. And on that, on that morning, I made a vow to his memory, to his family, and to myself 
that I was going to put aside everything else I was doing and get justice for Sergei Magnitsky. And for the last eight years, that's what I've been doing. At first, I thought it would be possible to get justice inside of Russia, but it turned out there was no possibility whatsoever. They circled the wagons. They exonerated everybody in involved. Putin personally got involved in the exoneration. Um, they even gave promotions and state honors to the, some of the people most complicit. And in the most crazy miscarriage of justice I've ever seen, they put Sergei Magnitsky on trial three years after they killed him in the first ever trial against a dead man in the history of Russia and put me on trial as his co-defendant. We were both found guilty. They couldn't do anything more to Sergei. They sentenced me to nine years in absentia in Russian prison. So it's obvious we needed to get justice outside of Russia. And we came up with an idea, which is that the people who killed Sergei killed him for money, for $230 million. And they don't keep that money in Russia. They keep it in the West. And so I, I went to Washington, and I told the same story um, to two senators that I'm telling you today, to, to Senator Benjamin Cardin, a Democrat from Maryland, and Senator John McCain, Republican from Arizona. And I told them the story of Sergei Magnitsky, and I told them, can we ban the visas and freeze the assets of the people who killed Sergei and the people who do similar types of things in Russia? And that was the genesis of the Sergei Magnitsky Act. It was launched in October of 2007, and in November of 2012, it passed the Senate 92 to 4. It passed the House of, Representat <coughs> House of Representatives with 89%. And on the 14th of December 2012, President Obama signed it into law. There are now 44 people on the Magnitsky list um, whose, whose visas have been banned, whose assets have been frozen. And this makes Putin particularly crazy because Putin, in my opinion, is the richest man in the world. He's got $200 billion of net worth, and he believes that his money may eventually be frozen under the Magnitsky Act. I'm proud to say that it wasn't just the United States that has done this. After the United States passed the Magnitsky Act in December of last year, the little country of Estonia in the Baltics passed their Magnitsky Act. In May of this year, my home country, Britain, passed the Magnitsky Act. In October of this year, Canada passed the Magnitsky Act. And last week, Lithuania passed the Magnitsky Act. There are now five countries and more to come. We will never be able to bring Sergei Magnitsky back, and that's a burden that I will bear for the rest of my life. But I feel that at least we've given his death some meaning and his name a legacy, which will create consequences for people who do terrible things and hopefully prevent people from losing their lives in similar situations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill, for coming and for sharing with us this very powerful and dramatic story. Um, now, if I may lighten the mood just a little bit, let me start with a Russian joke. Question, what is the best way out of the Russian crisis? Answer, Moscow International Airport. Uh, the Russian crisis, of course, is bigger than the tragedy of Sergei Magnitsky. When I was doing research for my book, I interviewed business people who had been victims of expropriation, which is a sadly widespread phenomenon. Now, I could tell you all about the different ways in which you can lose money in Russia, but instead I would like to dig a little deeper and provide you with some context for why Russia seems to be stuck in this lawlessness and corruption. And this context has two parts to it, the hardware and the software. Let's start with the hardware, the geographical and historical legacies with which modern Russia is stuck. So Russia combines three factors that are big contributors to corruption. First, abundance of natural resources. Second, lack of a vibrant civil society and independent media. And third, extreme wealth inequality, as Bill mentioned. Russia's endowment in oil, gas, and precious metals and the lack of economic diversification 
has shifted entrepreneurial activity away from making products towards a political game which revolves around gaining access to the sale of natural resources. We see similar dynamics in countries like Zaire, Venezuela, Indonesia, or Nigeria. Meanwhile, the frailty of civil society and the weakness of independent media reduce the accountability of the state. This, of course, has been part of Putin's strategy to centralize power. Finally, the extreme concentration of wealth in Russia has its roots in the privatization of the 1990s. This concentration has further promoted the fusion of economic and political power. Throughout the 1990s, the leading business empires, the oligarchs at the top of them, penetrated the government at the highest levels, with oligarchs such as Berezovsky or Botanin assuming ministerial offices without abandoning the control of their business empires. Meanwhile, politicians became addicted to the financial support from the oligarchs without feeling the need to appeal to the public at large. Now, if we go back further, perhaps a few centuries, we can actually see that corruption was the very logic of the Russian Empire. This logic was called patrimonialism, to use a technical term. The system effectively fused sovereign ownership of property and power. There was no meaningful distinction between the public sector and the private sector. The Russian bureaucracy's unofficial motto in Russian was Sto kontrolliruju tema karmlus, which roughly translates to that which I manage, on it I feed. Although the state's patrimonial control over the economy and noblemen receded during the reforms of the 19th century, the 1917 communist revolution turned back the clock forcefully, while also adding terror and mass murder as instruments of state control during Stalin's three decades in power. Now, between Stalin's death in 1953 and the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, the nature of corruption changed dramatically as the state weakened and private, illegitimate, and concealed wealth began to accumulate. So by the 1990s, rather than being centered in Moscow, Russia was being torn apart by private mafias in terms of corruption. Russia's first post-communist president, Boris Yeltsin, in fact, called his own country the superpower of crime. A lot of assassinations and street violence took place during, the, during those years. I have a friend in St. Petersburg who one at some point told me, look, I'm growing tired of bankers being picked off by snipers, that is, hitmen who were positioned on the roofs of the buildings, would kill business people in broad daylight. So this is the 1990s. But my favorite assassination story is from 1995, when a charismatic business leader, Ivan Kivelidi, was poisoned in Moscow by rivals who left a hypertoxic substance on his phone receiver. So he inhaled the fumes when he picked up the phone. And to make this even more macabre, his secretary and the autopsy examiner also both died from the poison that was still emanating from Kivelidi's body when they found him. So Bill, all things considered, you're pretty lucky, knock on wood. <laughs> um, so when Putin came to power, his goal was to re-centralize Russian corruption so that Moscow would once again call the shots, pun intended. Interestingly, many Russians have been on board with this project, and this kind of makes sense. Centralized corruption is deeply unfair, but it tends to be less violent for the majority of the population and also less detrimental for the economy when compared to decentralized corruption run amok. Putin's economic team has also been professional enough to keep macroeconomic factors stable while subsidizing the vulnerable parts of the population. But let's turn to the software behind Russia's current form of corruption, that second big factor. And this software has to do with the mentality of the Russian elites. Russia is currently ruled by the so-called Siloviki, that is state employees from the Secret Service, the military, and the Interior Ministry. While these state agencies had been traditionally in charge during the Soviet period, they experienced profound humiliation during the 1990s, morally, financially, and geopolitically. Financially, these former masters saw their livelihoods dwindle as the Russian state went bankrupt 
just when a group of brash private bankers, the oligarchs, was flaunting their new wealth and buying up energy assets. Morally, the Seleviki were no longer regarded as the elite by the Russians. Instead, the Russians began to ask questions about Stalinist crimes committed during the Soviet period. And finally, geopolitically, Russia was no longer a superpower, having lost the Cold War, which these people had spent their whole lives fighting. So when Putin came to power, he could rely on a very, very angry group of Siloviki who wanted everything, power, wealth, and prestige. Obviously, this kind of mentality just adds fuel to the fire if we consider how it interacts with the historical geographical factors to entrench what Russia's current Prime Minister Medvedev has called legal nihilism. So overall, this combination of hardware and software behind Russia's corruption is why the international airport may seem like the best way out. But maybe Bill Browder's activity suggests there is another way. And I guess that's where our panel discussion will continue. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joel Samuels. I'm a member of the law faculty here at USC and the director of the Rule of Law Collaborative here on campus. I'll be leading th this evening's discussion, which I hope will be a spirited one with Bill Browder, and I'm joined by colleagues from across the university. My colleague Bob Cox from the Political Science Department and director of the Walker Institute of International Studies. To the far left, Andy Spicer, associate professor of the Donald Moore School of Business and Stan Marcus, from whom you just heard, also of the Donald Moore School of Business. More complete bios are available on each of us, but we don't want to waste time introducing ourselves. I do want to point out that when you entered, you were provided with blue cards. This will provide an opportunity. If you have questions you'd like to ask, I'd ask you to pass them to the end of your rows, and we have student volunteers who will collect them and pass them up here so that we can ask uh, questions from you, and we'll reserve uh, 10 to 15 minutes at the end of our discussion uh, for those questions, and also for those following us on Facebook Live to pose their questions, and they also will be brought to me uh, here in the front. Uh, I will exercise the moderator's prerogative of asking the first question, and, and Bill, as someone who runs a center on rule of law and who spent a good deal of time in Russia during that formative period from 89 to 94, my question, my opening question really focuses on rule of law. I should point out that uh, if I had had your business acumen during that period, I probably would not be a member of our faculty. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 I, but I worked during that period, as we talked about earlier today, with a Russian journalist, Yuri Shikachikin, who was murdered in the early 2000s uh, in, in an early period of attacks on journalists. And so the experience that, that you describe is one that hits very close to home for me as well. And the absence of rule of law is one that I've, I've seen and experienced starting really in the early 90s. One question that I have involves the use of the term rule of law. As someone who runs a center on rule of law, I, s I see cynics who, who attack the use of the term as being too amorphous, which in fairness it can be at times, as being a term that can be used for political expediency at other times. And so I wonder, as we start our conversation, what rule of law means to you and how that term has evolved in your own mind in light of the experiences you've had. <clears throat> Well, so the, um, uh, you're, you're, it's, it's in, it's, you're right that they, there's lots of different ways of interpreting rule of law. And so, you know, um, the, the Russians, um, uh, in, in under, under the sort of what, the legal nihilism of Russia, everybody has broken the law and they can use the law um, to prosecute their enemies. That there's this expression, any, for, for, for my friends, anything, for my enemies, the law. Um, but but what, what I've discovered, um, uh, trying to enforce the law. I, I'm, I've been involved in a campaign to hold people responsible for, for murder. Um, I've discovered what law really is and, 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 and what it really means. And what it means, what it is, is, is to be able to um, go in front of a judge who's totally independent, who is basing things on a clear set of legal principles, and to make a reasoned legal decision. And that does not happen in Russia. Judges are, are instructed by telephone um, what the ruling should be. Um, uh, prosecutors are, are told to use their prosecution tools to go after enemies of the regime. Um, and Sergei Magnitsky, who was the ultimate lawyer, he believed in the rule of law so much that 
And every day when he was mistreated in prison, he wrote a complaint, sometimes twice a day. He wrote 450 complaints in his 358 days in detention, hoping that just by telling, telling you know, legally saying what was right and what was wrong, that the rule of law would, would prevail, and it didn't in Russia. And so, um, I mean, it's, 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 I guess there's, a, there's some famous expression from a judge about what is pornography. You know it when you see it. Um, the same thing is true with the rule of law. You've seen uh, over, the, over the past number of years, Russia attempt to use legal mechanisms against you, including Interpol quite recently. Uh, what concerns do you have about how international mechanisms provide tools essentially to a regime that's out to attack you? So, so in my experience, just to bring everyone up, up, to, up to date, um, Russia, so after Russia convicted me and Sergei Magnitsky in that posthumous trial and in absentia trial, um, they then started to chase me around the world using Interpol, the International Police Organization, with what they call Interpol Red Notices. And for those of you who um, see the bookstore or the book stand out, outside, my book is called Red Notice, which is named after one of these Interpol Red Notices. And um, Russia has applied to Interpol for a Red Notice five times to have me arrested. And each time Interpol says no, that violates our constitution you can't do that. It's a politically motivated case. We won't arrest him. And then Russia reapplies five times. The most recent one was about a month ago. And, um, and what it says is that, so, so Russia's a member of Interpol. They're a member of the United Nations. They're a member of the IMF. They're a member of all these international bodies. And they, they want to sort of abu uh, uh, misuse and abuse these bodies for their own sort of corrupt purposes. And so. Russia is really, uh, and it's not, it's not just Interpol, it's, uh, it's, it's everywhere, in every, every different international organization. They're currently, I think on um, uh, Wednesday this week, the International Olympic Committee is gonna be making a decision about whether Russia should be allowed to participate in the Olympics in, in Korea um, after the doping scandal. And they're using all their force and might and international pressure and corruption to try to make sure the decision is uh, in their favor. They, Every international organization, this is how they behave. Bob, you, you approach things from a European perspective. That's your background. What would, what would you like to ask, Bill? Thanks. Yes, in fact, Bill, I did want to ask you about the unity of the Western response because um, the Magnitsky Act has been adopted now by the UK, as you, as you mentioned in your talk, by Lithuania and Estonia and Canada. But other European countries really haven't embraced it very much. They've, they've supported the US on sanctions over Russia with following the um, annexation of Crimea, but not on these human rights issues. And I wonder if you think why, why that is the case, first of all, why, why the Europeans have responded this way, and whether that <coughs> is, is an invitation for Russian oligarchs to ignore this, because sure, a visa restriction means they can't go to New York, but they can still go to Nice or to Rome or some other interesting places and, and continue to do their business. Um, well, it's, first of all, you're right. So Europe is a more complicated place. Why is Europe more complicated? Well, actually, let's take a step back. Putin hates the Magnitsky Act. He hates it more than anything. He's made, he's, he made it his single largest foreign policy priority when he came back into the presidency in 2012. He wrote it down. This is my top foreign policy priority to make sure that the Magnitsky Act is repealed and doesn't spread. So he hates it. He's let everybody know he hates it. How did he let the United States know he hated it? He banned the adoption of Russian orphans by American families um, as a reaction to the Magnitsky Act. And I should point out that the orphans that are being adopted are the sick ones. They didn't, they didn't put the healthy ones up for adoption. They only they put the sick ones up for adoption. And the sick ones with HIV and Down syndrome and various things. And Americans would still come to, to, to Russia and adopt these children. And by banning the adoption, he was basically sentencing his own orphans to death. And the, and the message there was, uh, I'm so angry with this thing, I'm ready to kill my own children to point out how angry I am. So he hates it. And so, the Europe, so in, in Europe, they're not nearly as independent as, as, as the United States and, and Canada um, in that they take gas from, from Russia, they have, uh, they have all sorts of Russian money flowing in trade and so on and so forth. And, and Putin is saying, listen, I hate this Magnitsky Act and I, I've got leverage over you. And so the Europeans are are definitely more circumspect about doing that. Having said that, um, I'm trying to create a situation where it becomes 
uh, eventually impossible for countries not to do it. So we've, we, the, originally the argument was, uh, well, the United States is doing it. The United States is a superpower. They're, they're unilateral. Uh, that we, 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 don't, we can't do it in Sweden or wherever because of that. Now all of a sudden I've got the United States and Canada doing it. In Canada, they, there's no such thing as anti-Canadianism. And so they, they uh, and then the UK. And, and, and so eventually there's, there's safety in numbers. There's no moral argument about doing it. And eventually it becomes something where it becomes, if, if you're one of the last countries holding out uh, in Europe, um, you're going to look pretty bad. And having said that, um, uh, France is my number one, is the, is the, big, is the big prize. Um, Every self-respecting Russian oligarch has a villa in the south of France, in Saint-Tropez, Cap Ferrat, et cetera. And, that's, and if they're banned from France, that would really hit them where it counts. So that's where we're starting our big project for 2018. Well, if I could follow up, do you think the Magnitsky Act uh, provides a deterrence? Um, or, is it, or are you satisfied that it would just penalize people who might have been implicit in, in, in the crimes against Sergei Magnitsky? If I were a small, lower-level oligarch, I might say, I'm, I'm too small to be affected by this. It's the big ones. It's the 44 at the top who are really uh, going to be affected. Um, the answer is that they're all absolutely terrified and scared to death of the Magnitsky Act because it's this total unknown. Nobody knows, nobody knows who, who's going to get hit and how. If you're, if you're a Russian oligarch or a Russian secret policeman or a Russian criminal of some sort, and you've done something terrible in Russia, and you have a lot of money. Um, uh, you used to be able to keep your money safe in the West. You used to be able to put your money in London and New York, and 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 you always felt like you know if things got hot and terrible in Russia, you could always flee to the West. And all of a sudden, we've created this thing where, if things are hot and terrible in Russia, they can't flee to, to the countries they want to flee to, and their money might be frozen. And that's terrifying for one of these Russian bad guys. Let me turn to my right to Stan, who works on these issues in this region. And Stan, what are your thoughts? So my first question follows directly on, on Bob's line of uh, inquiry. Uh, Bill, you mentioned that the Russian oligarchs are scared of the Magnitsky Act. Now, Russia by now has been hit with three waves of sanctions, right? 2012 Magnitsky Act, 2014 sanctions connected to Russia's aggression in Ukraine, 2016 Russian meddling in the US elections, and despite all of this fear and all of these targeted sanctions, right, neither the high-ranking state officials nor the oligarchs have abandoned their support of Putin. So the question is, why is that the case, and do you see any realistic scenario under which the Kremlin's elite coalition might split? Well, there, there's a very <clears throat> important assumption you're making in the question, which is that the oligarchs, these wealthy guys, are independently wealthy. And the answer is that, that um, and, and uh, let me just tell you a story which will give you the answer. That, so I go to Davos, to the World Economic Forum each year. And at the World Economic Forum, you have um, billionaires from all different countries. You have Italian billionaires and American billionaires and French and Chinese and et cetera, and Russian. And the Americans and the Italians are, are walking around just back slapping and shaking hands and networking and passing cards and inviting each other and drinking and so on and so forth. And the Russians are all huddled together in one, one hotel lobby of one hotel, not interacting with anybody. And they're absolutely terrified. They're terrified because if they say or do the wrong thing, at any moment, they can lose their money, they can be arrested, or they can be killed. And why is that? Because they're not independently wealthy, they're dependently wealthy. And their wealth completely and absolutely depends on Vladimir Putin and those people close around him. And therefore, um, they're not independent. They can't. There, any of these guys that even conceived or, or, or made a, a, a whiff of disloyalty towards Putin, would, 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 they would end up losing their money and going, going to jail. Putin even sometimes goes after the loyal ones just to show them. There's one, there's one called uh, Yevtushenkov, who's recently had all of his, or a bunch of his assets expropriated. And he's not even a disloyal oligarch. It's like in, that, in those, those mafia movies where the mafia boss walks around the table and just like blows away one of his deputies just to show everybody that that's what he does, and, and that's, what, that's what's going on in Russia. So I don't believe there's any chance that the oligarchs will ever get rid of Vladimir Putin. There's a chance that maybe the secret policemen around him could do that at some point if he becomes too much of a liability. Or there's the chance that the Russians themselves um, do it. 140 million Russians 
he can't, there's no way Vladimir Putin can fight against 140 million people if all of a sudden they turn on him. And that's what he's most afraid of, is, is having the same thing happen in Russia that happened in Ukraine, where the people just all one day en masse came out to Maidan Square and eventually drove the president out of the country. There's actually a Russian saying that connects to what you mentioned about the oligarchs. It says there are no billionaires in Russia, only people working as billionaires. <laughs> so the Russians are usually pretty good at summarizing the state of affairs. Now, as an academic, I get hung up in definitions a lot. And one definition of an oligarch is a private wealthy individual who can change state policy. So Bill, your financial success and your amazing ability to change state policy in both the EU and the US leads to a simple question. Are you an oligarch? <laughs> <laughs> wow, I ne I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I, um, uh, <laughs> um, I, I think that, that going back to your definition question, or your, the definition, these are people who are state changing state policy to enrich themselves. And, um, mm. and I have, I, I'm in the business of changing state policy to punish people um, who have been human rights violators. Um, <laughs> Andy, uh, you focus on issues of ethics and corruption and also in this space. We'll turn to you. Sure. I'm going to ask some questions for the students in the audience, and I know one of them, a lot of them want to act like billionaires someday, so it, uh, it's <laughs> useful. You talked about some moments in your life when you were 32 and sounded like you got rich too quickly. Uh, then you made another fortune, and you had another moment around Sergei Magnitsky. But what advice would you give to your former self if you could go back and tell yourself during that time period, and, and how would that transfer to our students today? Well. Um, a lot of people have asked me, what, what would I have done differently um, knowing now, knowing then what I know now? And I would say I would have a pretty dramatic response to that question, which is I would have never gone to Russia in the first place. I mean, I, I made a lot of money in Russia. Um, I became a very important person in Russia. Um, but the tragedy and the heartbreak and the guilt of Sergei Magnitsky um, being killed at the age of 37 negates all of that and then some. If I could turn back the clock and make that, and make Sergei Magnitsky still alive, I would have given up all that other stuff and, and, and uh, not gone to Russia. You know, I graduated from Stanford Business School. Had I just stayed in Silicon Valley, um, I could have um, been dealing with all sorts of nice people and no one would have been murdered and who knows, maybe, I, maybe I'd be even more successful today. Could you, could, oh, hold on, I'm sorry. Do, it, do we have time? No, Bob has a follow-up, I think, on this sure, stuff. I, I wanted to follow up on exactly this point. I represent the not the business school, but the liberal arts side of our campus. And we, we are now engaged in, in, in an effort to try to bring an international awareness to our students because we think it's important for them to succeed in the global economy. So we want them to learn languages. We want to, them to have understanding of different cultures around the world. You went to Russia with no language skills and, and no real background in Russian history or culture. Are we telling our students the wrong thing? Well, um, yes, I still don't speak Russian, and everyone gives me a hard time <laughs> about that. Um, even though I lived there for 10 years, I ended up with a, um, uh, a wife who spoke perfect English, a Russian wife who spoke perfect English, and my staff is all perfectly English-speaking. The, um, uh, I mean, basically, it all depends on what you're trying to maximize. So um, one of the reasons that I was successful in business in Russia before all this terrible stuff happened was that I, I was totally uh, laser focused on the numbers, valuations, assets, all business tools because I was trying to maximize profit and I wasn't spending any time reading Russian literature, learning the language, or doing any of that kind of stuff. And if, you're, if, if, you're, if the point of life is to maximize on one small set of variables, which is profit maximization, then perhaps that's not the right thing to be teaching them, but that's not what you're, you know, you're, you're trying to um, teach people to be well-rounded, sort of proper, you know, global citizens, and, and in doing so, I think what you are teaching is a good thing to teach. And, and, uh, uh, and perhaps if I had read more Russian history, I would have known what I know now, which is that Russian stories never have happy endings. And, uh, <laughs> and go ahead. Well, based on the questions I have so far, we're going to change our ending time from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., if that's okay. Uh, the first question, and I'm not going to, I know your cards had your names on them, but I'm going to ask all the questions anonymously. 
When it's going on Facebook Live around the world for the Russians to see. So. Exactly. <laughs> Every question posed by Joel Samuels. Uh, when, when economic incentives fail, what are other ways to hold the guilty accountable in your view? Um, well, uh, I guess, I, I guess the, I'm not sure exactly what the question is implying, but um, the, the, uh, in the world that we live in today, well, actually, let me take a step back. When the Khmer Rouge was, was um, uh, conducting mass genocide in Cambodia, they weren't going on vacation to Saint-Tropez. Um, but I can tell you that the Russians are, the Uzbeks are, the Kazakhs are who are doing all these terrible things. And so in a globalized world, um, I wouldn't call them economic incentives or economic punishments, but basically in a globalized world, to, make, to bring people back so where they can't take advantage of a globalized world is pretty, pretty terrifying, particularly for the elite, and particularly for the people who have a lot of money, and so that is an extremely powerful tool. Um, and and we, we, we also continue to have the, the um, you know, if these, if these countries um, ter terribly behave, we, we, ha we still have the tools of the International Criminal Court and, and other things. But the beautiful thing about sanctions and the sanctions that we came up with is that it's a sanction against specific individuals. It's kind of like a modern-day cancer drug, which it kills the cancer cell and doesn't kill the patient. And in the past, everybody has talked about sanctions and thinks about, you know, taking, you know, making the entire population of a country poor, and you don't have to do that with these sanctions. You go after just the elite, and that they hate. We did have a, someone who asked how people are placed on the Magnitsky Act on the list, and what investigations are done for that to happen. So the Russians like to like to spread this story that um, that it's it's so arbitrary that Bill Browder can make an, a Magnitsky list and sanction Russians. And I wish I was so powerful. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I have to deal with um, enormous um, and highly rigorous government bureaucracies that, that need to verify every last bit of information that I provide to them. I provided 282 names to the, to the US Department of State and Department of Justice of who should be sanctioned on the Magnitsky case, along with evidence to support those 282 names. And so far, um, there are 44 people on the Magnitsky list 35 of them come from those 282 names. And so it's a hard thing to do. It's based on effectively a criminal justice standard. That's de it's determined not by me or, or others. It's determined by evidence that's gathered by the US government. And the same thing is true in Canada, and the same thing is true in the UK. It's extremely hard to get somebody on, on the Magnitsky list. And while it's frustrating for me that, that it's so hard, it does uh, raise the credibility and the, and the durability of it, because there's very little that anyone can question about it. So here's a question I imagine you've heard before. I'd be curious your thoughts on it. Since the corruption in Russia, or less versions of it, led to your early success and later the death of someone very close to you, do you see corruption as an economic opportunity at all or solely as a, as a net negative? Well, the um, um, corruption is never an opportunity. So, the, so in, in our case, the opportunity was um, if you could invest in a company that's trading at a, at a low multiple, a low PE ratio of profit after stealing, and then stop the stealing, it's even cheaper afterwards. Um, but it was never an opportunity, I mean, it was an opportunity to stop the corruption, but, but corruption was never an opportunity. Um, but, and, and corruption, what, uh, a lot of people ask me, um, uh, where do you invest now? And, and the answer is, although I made all of my money in emerging markets, I only have my money invested in, in the United States and Western Europe, specifically and only because in the United States and Western Europe, you have a rule of law and you have property rights, and you don't in emerging markets. And, and, uh, and so that's, that tells you a lot about how I feel about corruption and where the opportunities are. And I'll just add, this is something that the Rule of Law Collaborative looks at regularly here in Colombia and in programs that we host. We just hosted a program in May focused on rule of law and private enterprise and asking how private enterprise can foster development and how in emerging markets they face real challenges. I want to ask you a question that's actually something we talked about earlier today that someone in the audience has asked, which is, do you think cryptocurrency, like Bitcoin, enables oligarchs to avoid sanctions and launder money in the West? Very good question, very important question. And the answer is that if, if uh, every Russian um, criminal is now using Bitcoin as a way to transfer money, and I, and I know this because um, th that it's impossible to launder money now, to really launder money using the banking system because everything leaves a permanent trail. And we've been involved in a money laundering investigation in, um, against the people who, who killed Sergei Magnitsky, and we found all the money, and there's prosecutions going on around the world. Um, that doesn't happen with Bitcoin. And so 
I, I know a lot of people that are all starry-eyed and, and excited about Bitcoin and, and so on, and I can tell them, and I can tell you, with, with, clear, with a clear head, that it's a money laundering instrument that will be regulated in the future. There's no government that is going to allow Bitcoin to not be regulated so that it can be an anonymous way to, to launder money. And so, you know, I don't know if it goes from, what, I don't know where it's trading at today, but 11,000 to 25,000, but eventually it's going to be regulated and a lot of the people who have been jamming up the price aren't going to find the value of it anymore because it's, it's not going to be an anonymous money laundering tool. Stan. Just a very quick follow-up. Bill, could you maybe update us on efforts to find Putin's money? Who is involved and how close are we? Well, so um, one of the first big, uh, uh, most of you have probably heard of the Panama Papers. The Panama Papers was a leak that came out a, a year and a half ago out of a law firm in Panama that is doing all sorts of international offshore um, uh, company formation, and registration, et cetera. And from the Panama Papers, um, one of the famous people who came out of the Panama Papers was a guy named Sergei Roldugan. Sergei Roldugan is a cellist. He's a cellist in the Mariinsky Orchestra, and he's worth $2 billion. I don't think that if you took all the cellists in the world together... <laughs> His music is really good. I've listened. <laughs> <laughs> it's an absurdity. And, and, and when you get into the details of how he got the money, it's like from gifts, investment advisory fees to Sergei Roldugan of $70 million. So he's a cellist and an investment advisor. So that's $2 billion of the $200 billion. And basically, there's a whole bunch of these characters. And um, so, so we're, it's impossible in principle to find Putin's money. That's the well, I can tell you exactly where Putin's money is. You just go down a list of the top oligarchs, and you apply the 50% rule to their money, and that's Putin's money. And they all have accounts at J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley, et cetera. And so um, if you want to know where Putin's money is, it's invested in hedge funds, private equity funds, real estate, U.S. stocks, et cetera. Um, through major U.S. and international financial institutions. Let me shift gears a little bit and turn to maybe a quasi-geopolitical question. This comes from Facebook Live, and the question is, how did corruption in Russia support their invasions of Georgia and Ukraine? Good question, and it comes to the crux of the issue. So I, I have a different vantage point than, than, than um, most political experts on Russia, in that I, I believe, and I think and I'm confident in my belief, that everything that's going on in Putin's behavior is based on this theft of 200 billion. So Putin has stolen 200 billion from oligarchs and from the state and from the Russian people. And it's really hard to steal that kind of money. And I should point out that that's money that's been stolen from, from the state that doesn't go to pay for health care, education, filling the potholes in the road, providing basic state services. And you, can't, you can only do that for so long in a quasi-democracy before the people get really angry. And so what do you do if people are starting to grumble and get angry at you as the head of state? You try to deflect that anger away from you towards something else. And so what do you deflect it away towards? Foreign enemies. And um, Ukraine is a prime example. Ukraine, Russia has no, Russia has no beef with Ukraine. There is nothing the Ukrainians have done that, that has justified this invasion. They just created a 24-hour news cycle for about a month and a half claiming that Ukrainians were fascists and Nazis and they were going to be murdering Russian-speaking people in eastern Ukraine and eating Russian babies. And, and on the back of that, they got everybody into such a state that they then invaded on a humanitarian mission. Um, and all of a sudden, Putin's approval ratings go through the roof. And same thing in Syria. And, and it comes down to a really important issue, which is that Putin is not stopping with Syria and Ukraine and Georgia. He's going to do more. And it all comes back to his corruption. And so when, when people ask me in Washington how to deal with, with Russia, I always say that all this idea of engaging in appeasement doesn't work. The only thing that we can do is contain this man. A couple of different people have asked variations on a similar question. What does a post-Putin Russia look like? What do you think the chances in the next 10 years of seeing a democratic Russia are? Uh, what's your forecast as you look at, at Russia today? 
So um, unfortunately, I think that there's only about a 10% chance of what I call the Maidan scenario. Maidan is the name of the square in Ukraine where people gathered to overthrow the president of Ukraine. Um, the reason I think it's a, such a low chance is that Putin has created a, such a, a repressive uh, country that any, any spark of, of dissent gets quashed too quickly. And just to give you some examples, Putin has, has, has formed something called the Presidential Guard, which consists of 500,000 people. And those 500,000 people have been trained and ordered, if necessary, to fire on Russian citizens if there's a coup attempt, because he's so afraid. And so as a result, I think there's only a 10% chance of what I call the Maidan scenario in the next 10 years. I would put a 20% chance of a palace coup. But again, a palace coup, you know, where some other member of his regime d decides to get rid of him, is very low because Putin is afraid of a palace coup. And so he's constantly trying to create little fake palace coup movements to see who's receptive and then crushes those people. Unfortunately, the, 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 um, the most likely outcome is what I call the Mugabe scenario. Mugabe is the president of Zimbabwe, who's been around for 30 plus years. And I give that a 70% chance. And for those of you who pay attention to Zimbabwe, it was quite a wealthy country 30 years ago, and, and this man has completely made it to an economic basket case. And that's what Putin will do as, the, as, his, um, as his repressions continue, as oil prices flounder, and as sanctions continue to bite. I have to say, I went from the Russia world to Zimbabwe, where I lived in 95 and 96, and was declared persona non grata by Mugabe as a result of an article that could not have been less uh, critical of him. And yet, you see the power, the, any, any threat to an individual in a, in, a, in, a, in a state where there isn't truly rule of law ends up being a moment for, uh, that's treated as an absolute attack. And that's the important difference, I think, between rule of law, rule by law. It isn't that there, is, there aren't laws in place. It isn't that there aren't laws even enforced. It's that they're enforced capriciously. It's that they're enforced for purpose and that government leaders at the highest levels aren't held accountable in the end. Uh, Andy, Bob, before I turn to more questions, some questions you guys might have. I'll keep it going. I've got some, a number of people have asked questions that deal with the, the campaign against you. So talking about the, the documentary, actually documentaries, is the plural, that have been made against you. How do you, uh, how do you uh, cope with those as they come out? How do you address them? Uh, it's obviously a long-term campaign that's been, that's been developed. Yeah, so, so the, the Russian government, or Putin, has a lot of different things he's trying to do to me. They'd like to kill me if they could get away with it. Uh, they would like to kidnap me and get me back to Russia if they could get away with it. And I've been warned there was an attempt a couple years ago. They're trying to extradite me and have me arrested. They're suing me for in different locations for money, for libel, for various other types of things. Um, and they, um, uh, they made me into a movie star. Um, I, I'm the star of seven different movies in Russia. <laughs> if you watch Russian television, and you see me, you would think I am the most, they, they've, they've accused me of, of serial murder, they've accused me of espionage, they've accused me of every crime. You would think I am Al Capone if you watched uh, Russian television. Um, how do I deal with it? I, I, I um, kind of laugh. I mean, uh, I don't actually even, I mean, they come out so frequently, I don't even watch these things anymore. Um, uh, having said that, there was an interesting one a couple weeks ago where they did all sorts of great family research into my grandfather, and I saw where he lived when he grew up and various other things. So, so there's some, some benefit as well. Um, <laughs> family, it's Ancestry.com brought to life. No, I mean, I, I couldn't have done, you know, I'd have to hire some researchers to go to the archives, and they'd probably even be closed, but I got to see, like, the home address. It was really great where, where they lived and, and uh, all sorts of other interesting ID card that my grandfather carried around. It was all very cool. This was going to be my closing question. It comes from Facebook Live, but it plays to what you were just talking about. Do you fear for your safety on U.S. soil? And do you, um, yeah. Um, I, I certainly did not view this as the prime position seated next to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't fear. I don't fear. Um, doesn't mean that there's no great risk. So I mean, this has been going on now for eight years, and, and you can't spend eight years living in fear. So I go about my life with my head held high and I'm not going to buckle under the, under the threat of Russian violence. Um, uh, and I would much rather live, um, uh, or 
die standing up than, than live on my knees um, in fear. But I, but I take, of course, many precautions so I don't die. Um, and um, I, I'm not going to tell you what they are. Uh, <laughs> but I'm still here, and I intend to be here, and, um, and they should fear me because um, I'm going to create a, a economic hell for these people, for what they did and what they do to, to surrogate and what they did to other people. So well, this actually goes to something that I, uh, maybe towards the closing that I do wonder. Your single-mindedness is really powerful, I think palpable to all of us here today. It's a single-mindedness that led to your success in business in Russia in the 1990s. It's now a single-mindedness that you've turned towards human rights in Russia. At a, at a moment when you are comfortable that you've succeeded, however one defines success here, Putin, the oligarchs, where can you envision turning this single-mindedness? Can you imagine turning it to other countries, human rights elsewhere, or will your folk, do you have a sense of where that might go? Well, I, I, um, I have a lot of, I've become sort of famous in the field and lots of people come to me with their issues and their problems and, you know, there's no end to the number of nasty things going on in the world and there's no end. And once you kind of get, hear the stories, you can't just walk away from them. And so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in this for, the, for, for, for good, um, you know, going after bad guys and helping out victims. I think that's a wonderful ending note. Please join me in thanking Bill Browder. was sharing with us earlier today that this was his first experience here in Columbia at the University of South Carolina, and we were very hopeful this will not be the last, and we hope that um, the turnout tonight shows you how much interest there is in, in your work and your story. I do have a, a few closing notes. First, I'd like to thank all of you for your participation, for your questions. I tried to get to as many of them as I could. This will weigh me down tonight on the way home. Um, I want to thank my fellow panelists for their insights and contributions and invite all of you to share in the opportunities here on campus that, are, that exist through all the many colleges uh, here on campus to share with the scholars uh, uh, here in Columbia. I want to thank uh, Chris Mangum and Alston and Bird for facilitating Bill's presence here tonight and also for their gracious financial support. Uh, I'd also like to thank our other sponsors, Rachel and Jim Hodges, the Ra Rachel and Jim Hodges Fund, the Sunoco Distri Distinguished Visiting Professorship, the USC Business Partnership Foundation, and the Folk Center for International Business, led by Al Langto, who has spearheaded this event and has built a world-class center here at USC. Al, really wonderful job in putting this event together. And finally, I'd like to thank the members of our Board of Trustees here. I did see William Hubbard and his wife, Cappy, here, and there may be others as well, so thank you for being here. Uh, Bill, uh, we, have, we have a couple of final announcements. Bill will be uh, signing his, his book, Red Notice, uh, A True Story of High fi Finance Murder and One Man's Fight for Justice. The book is available for sale just outside of room 108 to your right as you exit the room, and he'll be signing copies there until about 7.30 uh, this evening. We want to remind you that the 37th Annual Economic Outlook Conference will take place this Friday from noon to 4 p.m. at the USC Alumni Center. You saw some slides about it if you were here in advance of the event. This year's event focuses on the workforce challenges facing South Carolina. And looking for, forward a bit, we hope to see many of you at the Rule of Law Collaborative Symposium on Women as Agents of Change in Rule of Law. You have a pamphlet in your, uh, in your folder about that. We have an extraordinary speaker coming from South Africa, Mampela Rampele, uh, who is an author, academic, former government minister and businesswoman, and uh, William Hubbard will be leading a conversation with her on the evening of the 21st. And then on the 22nd of February, we'll have an all-day event featuring, featuring leaders from South Carolina and around the world focused on women as agents of change and rule of law. And we hope to use that event to launch an online platform on the Rule of Law Collaborative's website focused on narratives of women engaged in rule of law and uh, making a difference in the world. And so we, uh, we encourage you to look for these and other events happening at the university. And uh, I'd like to wish you all a safe journey home. And once again, thank you to Bill Browder for being here tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you.